Good morning. My name is Grant Bosart, worship leader at Silverdale United Methodist Church. I'd like to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to our worship this morning. You know, tomorrow is March 1st, and what does that mean? It means that spring is just around the corner. And that's the time when I think of buds starting to form on the trees, there's a freshness in the air, the birds are singing. But it's also a time that I'm reminded of the scripture that tells us that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. May God's face shine on you this day and give you hope of good things to come. Amen.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. The God who called me here below will be forever mine. My change for your wisdom and your guidance as we continue to our journey. We ask for your forgiveness for all the sins that we have committed and our shortcomings. Lord, bless the message the pastor is going to deliver to us. Lord, we just want to praise your name and lift your name on high. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Silverdale United Methodist Church. My name is John Weston. I'm the pastor and I'm so glad that you are with us this morning. Our mission is serving Jesus, loving people, and living his word. We're glad that you are, you know, this, took the time to tune in. Ask God to come. The Holy Spirit will visit you, whether you're streaming with us in real time or maybe you've waited till later in the day or even later in the week. God wants to come and touch you. He wants to fill your heart, fill your life. He wants to take you from darkness to light. There is nothing like following Jesus. That's who we are. And to, to sum that up, there, is, there are the, the classic creeds of the church. This is one of the old, it's probably the oldest that is still in use today. It came from the, uh, the second, uh, probably the late second century A.D., and as a summation of what we believe. If you'd like to say this with me, we're going to go ahead and put the words on the screen for you. This is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Let's continue to worship. This is the time in our service where you have an opportunity to give back just a portion of what God has blessed you with. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can mail a check to Silverdale United Methodist Church. P.O. Box 1400, Silverdale, Washington, 98383. 
or you can go online at www.silverdale-umc.org slash give. And that information is also on the bottom of the screen. In preparation for our offering, I'd ask if you could join me in the Lord's Prayer this morning. Oh God, we come to you with such thanks for all the blessings that you have given us, especially during these difficult times. We're thankful, God, that you give us strength. We're thankful for the help. We're thankful for being able to still come together and worship you, Heavenly Father, even if it's virtually. God, we just give you thanks and ask that you would bless what is provided for you today for your kingdom. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. There's a peace of come to
Good morning, Silver Day United Methodist Church. I am Ellen. Today's scripture reading is read in Filipino and English from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Mga Hebreyo, Kabanatang 12, Talatang 1 hanggang 3, Magandang Balita, Biblia. Kaya nga, dahil napapaligiran tayo ng napakaraming saksi, Tanggalin natin ang anumang balakid at ang kasalanan kumakapit sa atin. Buong tiyaga tayong tumakbo sa takbuhing nasa ating harapan. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 New Living Translation Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Ituon natin ang ating paningin kay Jesus sa Kanya na kasalalay ang ating pananampalataya mula simula hanggang katapusan. Dahil sa kagalakang naghihintay sa Kanya, hindi niya inalintana ang kahihiyan ng pagkamatay sa krus at siya ngayon nakaupo sa kanan ng trono ng Diyos. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Isip-isipin ninyo kung gaano ang tiniis niyang pag-uusig sa kamay ng mga makasalanan upang hindi kayo manlupaypay o panghinaan ng loob. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. Exodo, Kabanatang Labinsyam, Talatang Lima, Magandang Balita, Biblia. Kung susundin ninyo ako at magiging tapat sa ating kasunduan, kayo ang magiging bayang hinirang. Ang buong daigdig ay akin Ngunit kayo'y aking itatangi. Exodus chapter 19 verse 5, New Living Translation If you hear my voice and if you guard my covenant, then of all the people of earth, you will be my personal treasure, for all the earth is mine. This is the word of God for the people of God. And welcome to the message portion of today's worship service. My name is David Snapper. We're beginning a series of messages that will prepare us for Good Friday and for Easter, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Where your treasure is, your heart will be there also, is what Jesus said to his followers. We're going to follow that theme today. How did Jesus see the treasures of God? And I hope you'll enjoy it as we prepare for this message, as we introduce the series on the treasures of our hearts. You know, you may not realize this, but you're God's treasure. That's right. You're God's treasure. He treasures you, thinks the world of you. Doesn't think the world of everything we do, but he treasures you because you're his. Early on in the Bible, God spoke to Abram and to Sarah, and he said, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing to all the nations. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. That's quite a statement. God really intended to do his work right through this people because he treasured them. A little bit later on in the Bible, in the uh, book of Exodus 19, you find something very similar. God says to his people as they came out of slavery, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession. 
among all the peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine. He said, I will treasure you. That's right. Like a precious gemstone, I will think of you as my treasure. I could have had anyone, but I want you. Jesus would say something very similar. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to that person and make our home with you. That's how much God treasures you. He will be with you, live with you, come into your life. The book of Hebrews, therefore, that we read, tells us that we lay aside everything that interferes with getting this treasure. We run the race that's set before us. Anything that entangles our feet and trips us up and leads us astray, we want to get rid of it. Don't let sin entangle us. Run with perseverance, a race marked out for you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. No matter how hard it was, how long the race was, he had one thing in mind to get back to that throne and to bring us with him, the treasured people of God, to save us from this world. And he would do whatever it takes. Now, my hair, I'm going to illustrate, has grown longer over the last year because in the last year, we've been careful to avoid the, the virus. I promised Nancy, you know, early on in the, in the uh, pandemic, that I wouldn't expose myself to the virus unless I really needed to, like to go to the store, because it was important to keep her healthy and safe. And so I just made a covenant. And I didn't do that. Now, almost a year later, it's growing a lot longer. And I look at it every day and I say, I could go get a cut. And I say, no, I made a covenant. I'm not going to get 11 months into this and then take a shortcut and quit. I'm going to stick it out to the end because at the end is where the prize is. If I get 11 months through this and then, oh, well, it doesn't matter. And then I bring the virus home. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? That'd be one of those reckless and foolish things. And I don't want to be that because the prize is to getting all the way to the end, not 11 months, all the way to the end. Run, says the book of Hebrews, all the way to the end, because at the end is where your prize is. That's where Jesus is, the author, but the perfecter, the finisher of your faith. That's where the crowd sits in the bleachers and they cheer you on. Come on, come on, you can make it all the way to the end. You say it's hard, it's difficult, I stumbled, I hurt. The crowd says, get up, go, you can make it. Try again. God will get you all the way home give you another illustration of what I mean. There was a Harvard dropout in the early 1970s. Pretty bright guy, but uh, dropped out of Harvard. What a bad choice that was. He started up a company, you've probably heard of it, Traffic O Data. Traff O Data. That's right. They put sensors out on the roads to measure uh, cars and traffic on the road so they could adjust the uh, stoplights to help traffic flow better. Ever heard of that company? No. Think it was a success? No. Went out of business. That's a hardship. That's the kind of thing that struggles. We, we get up and we think, oh, I'm going to fail. He loses his money, his reputation. He could have gone home, lived with his rich parents. But he got up and he tried again. And then he wrote a little program called MS-DOS. And that's the beginning of Microsoft Corporation. He uh, was Bill Gates, but he had to go through a lot of failure before he found his treasure in the software business. Now, I don't care if you get your treasure in the software business, but I care that you get your treasure in heaven. And you've got to get up. You've got to keep going. Jesus, says Hebrews, had to get up, endure the scorn of evil people, to keep on going. Today we're going to talk about what Jesus endured and how you and I can do it to get all the way to the end to find our treasures in heaven. Okay, you with me? Here we go. Number one, Jesus reached the finish line because he was wholly given to his father's plan to treasure his people. That's right. He was wholly given 
to the Father's plan to treasure his people. John chapter 6, 38. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, his Father in heaven. In other words, from the very beginning, Jesus knew that he was going to do his Father's will, and that's the only thing that mattered to him. In John chapter 3, when Nicodemus and Jesus were talking how Nicodemus might become saved and he had to be born again, Nicodemus didn't quite get that, and Jesus was trying to figure out how to explain it to him. He said, I'll tell you how. In the desert, in the wilderness, while the people were being uh, taken out of Egypt and brought to the Holy Land, God's people, God's treasured people, one day they were attacked by snakes for their disobedience. And God said, I'll tell you what, I'll show you how I'm going to save you. Take a bronze serpent, put it on a stick, raise it up, and whoever looks at that serpent, I'll make him well again. Well, that's the strangest thing. We find it very difficult that this snake, which was probably the um, Egyptian cobra, deadly snake, would be the symbol of healing. I, I don't understand it. But the ancient world, they did. To this day, our medical symbols are either two snakes called a caduceus or uh, a single snake on a stick like this one. And it's a symbol of death and healing all at once. I don't get it. But Jesus did and Nicodemus did. And Jesus said, when you see that stick, it will be a symbol of death, my death, and life. You look on that stick, on my cross. And that will be your salvation. You look to me when I'm dying, and I will save you. I will save you on that day. And then Jesus went on to say, For God so loved the world. See that four? That's connecting what he just said to what he's going to say now. God so loved the world. And when John says world, he means a sinful world. He gave his only son. He gave. And that word gave is the deal. He didn't loan him. He didn't borrow him. He didn't send him out as an experiment. He didn't give him a 30-day trial to see how it went. See if he could make some new friends in the world. No. God gave him. And it was a one-way ticket to earth until he died and it was raised again. God gave him to the world. I want to tell you about somebody else who gave their life in a spectacular way. In the early days of high-speed flight, aircraft engineers knew that they could break the speed of sound at 768 miles an hour. Now, that's really fast. 768 miles an hour is so fast that all the pilots who were test pilots, they put the throttle on their airplane right as they got to 768. They couldn't do it. The airplane would shake and it would be violent and jarring as the air turned into a solid object almost. And they would pull back on the throttle, come home and they say, couldn't do it. Nice try. Till one guy did. Chuck Yeager, I think was his name. He got right there, the airplane shook and he could pull back on the throttle and everybody would say, it's okay, Chuck. But he jammed the throttle forward. He broke the speed of sound and he made it because he treasured getting to the other side more than he treasured his life. And today, Chuck Yeager is the name that we all remember. At least I hope I got the name right. Jesus was that way. He didn't pull back. When it got bumpy with criticism and anger and hostility from his uh, detractors, he shoved the throttle forward and he blasted right through life and death and life again. Jesus reached the other side, his finish, because he thrived on his father's approval. That's right. He thrived on his father's approval. John 5. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, as my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. You know, Jesus' will, Jesus' purpose was to do his father's will. That's the only approval. It's the only affection he needed. And that's how he got through. He wasn't distracted by the other things that would trip him up. I spent time supervising community service workers, kids mostly, who got in trouble with the law, and many adults as well. I learned something over the years. If a kid has a parent who doesn't give him any love and affection, kids often get in trouble because they need love and affection. Those kids, you feel sorry for them because they will do anything just to get somebody to pay him attention, often trouble. But when there's a kid with a loving parent or some adult who really gives them the nurturing care, those kids, even when they get in trouble, the love of their parent 
pulls them through. You can get through some incredibly hard times if you know that your parents love you, even when you mess up. Oh, Jesus didn't mess up, but he knew his father loved him and he loved his father and nothing could distract him or get him into trouble because it didn't interest him. There was a time when Jesus was at a wedding in John chapter 2. He didn't intend to do anything there, just be there. But his mother saw that there was a need for wine. She said, hey, Jesus, they need wine. Jesus said, woman, why are you bothering me? It's not my time. These people aren't my problem. Leave me alone. Jesus looked at him, smiled, and said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay, okay, okay. I know, Pastor Dave is on a roll, and <laughs> he wanted me to make sure that everybody knew that, that he had a little slip-up in there. And what he meant to say is that after Jesus and, and his mother have this interaction where there's a problem at the wedding, they'd run out of wine, Jesus' mother, it's Mary who tells all the, the, the staff, the, the, the servants that are working the wedding, do whatever he tells you. Okay, pretty minor thing. This message is awesome. We're going to put you right back in. And he, and he said, said, okay. Jesus, Jesus loved, loved, respected his mother enough to obey her. Now, that's a surprising text. Until you realize that a normal, healthy relationship is for a young person, even an older young person like Jesus at age about 30. To honor and respect your mother is part of God's plan. And he did what he needed to do. To honor his mother. And all his life he spent honoring his father. And his mother as well. That's how he kept on track. You know, I hope you have an honor, a father and a mother that you honor. And that you have God a father, your father, that you honor with all your heart. Because it will keep you all the way to the end of your life. Third, Jesus reached the finish line of his life because he saw spiritual opportunity everywhere he went. That's right. Wherever he was, he saw that God was doing something in his life. There was probably never a boring day in his life, was there? So one day in John chapter 4, they're walking along and Jesus suddenly decides he's tired. And he sits down by the well outside of a, of a village, Sychar. And there he sits down, he's tired, and the other disciples say, okay, we'll go into town, we'll bring back Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we'll have a, a, a picnic here at the well after a little while. And so they head off to town and uh, leave Jesus alone. So you can imagine Jesus is tired. He pulls his hat down, he closes his eyes, he folds his hand, he's going to take a little sleep. And when you know it, just as he's about to go to sleep, a woman pulls up to the well, and she's going to draw some water out of the well. And Jesus could have closed his eyes and gone back to sleep and ignored her. But he didn't. He knew that God was going to do something, that he knew he was going to be involved in doing something for one of God's precious people. So he said, draw me some water out of the well. You're a Samaritan, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. We, we, we're not friends. I don't think I ought to do that for you. I might poison your water. And Jesus said, I've got living water. And off the conversation goes. She's fascinated. And he's going to tell her the gospel because he knows that wherever he goes, there's an opportunity that's far more than water. It's a spiritual opportunity to treasure the people that God treasures. It's another step on the way to God's eternal life. He took a chance to honor this person who really needed a lot of help. You know, you too are your rich, like Jesus. You've got the living water. The world is full of lots of water, but we need the living water of Jesus Christ. So you sit down, you take a rest, you could close your eyes, or you could open your eyes and see what God is doing around you, and see the miracles that take place all around. That's how we get to the end, because we're running the race God puts in front of us, and our eyes are open to see what he wants to do. Four, Jesus reached the finish line 
because he loved his flock with his life. That's right. He knew from the beginning, we saw in John chapter 3, 14, 15, and 16, that Jesus was given to the world. He wasn't like experimenting. No, he gave his life. Gave his life. I'm the good shepherd, John chapter 10. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I know these people and I treasure them. See that? I treasure my sheep. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep because they're everything to me and to my Father. We treasure you. You may not feel like it today. As you listen to me, you may feel like you're burdened and alone or weary. I got it. Injustice, unfairness, I got it. But you're still a treasure to God. His first relationship, Jesus, was to his Father and then his next commitment was to you, to treasure you. He put all the other interests aside in the words of uh, Hebrews 12 so that he could run the race. And his race was to bring you with him to heaven. He never said, Jesus didn't, hey, it's my turn to go first. Hey, I get to ride in the front seat. Hey, it's my night to have the remote control. He never said, hey, disciples, how come you never wash my feet, huh? He never said, hey, why is it that when I go out to dinner, all the Pharisees are always picking on me? Doesn't say that. It's just part of the job, and he knows it. There's injustice in the world. Come on, everybody, treat me better. Nope. He was in the hands of wicked people. Sinful men, says Hebrews. He endured the opposition of sinful men. Did he complain? No, because he loved his flock more than he cared about sinful mankind. There's a fellow who wrote a, a book, and uh, in the book, I, I, know that's, I guess that's obvious. There's a fellow who wrote a book I read, and he said that the average person spends one minute out of every five minutes on social media. Wow. I suppose he means during daylight hours. But that's a lot of hours, isn't it, in the course of a day? One in five? I'm not sure that that's an accurate number. But the point is, it's such an addictive thing social media, that many companies have had to make software programs so that people can't get on social media because it's such a huge distraction. It just limits their productivity in life because they're just always messing around. They just can't put it down once they pick it up and they look at them. They've got to check on this and check on that and see how this person... Jesus put everything down to save you. Never checked his email. He always checked on you and me because he came to save us. Maybe you'd like to put some things down, some things that get in the way of your life and your productivity. You could put them down to do the work of God, to call the flock. It could cost you a lot, but the gain would be eternal. Number five. Jesus reached the finish line because he never gave up on his disciples. I love this part. You know, he knew the score, and the score was the opposing team had 838 points, and his poor disciples had about zero points. They were getting clobbered. Wait a minute. They were the disciples. They were, they were great. They were heroes of the faith. Oh, no, they weren't. They abandoned Jesus. They didn't stand firm. They didn't trust him. They couldn't even stay awake while they were praying uh, in the garden the night before he was crucified. They couldn't get along with each other. They competed to see who was better. They wanted to bring fire down on people who were uh, healing, but they, they weren't one of Jesus' disciples. Man, these guys were competitive and narrow, and, and they just, they were just hopeless. But did Jesus say, oh, I'm going to trade these guys in for a whole new set of letters? No. For those of you who don't play Scrabble, that means I was going to get some new disciples. He never did that because he knew they were losers right from the start. He didn't care. He came to save them, not to coach them. He didn't come along to encourage them. And I'm not trying to encourage you either. I'm trying to say, you and I, we need a savior. We need somebody to fix us. We don't need somebody to give us a few good ideas. We need somebody to redeem us. We're hurt. We're lost sometimes. Sometimes we're lost in our own excellence and our own accomplishment. We think, wow, I'm so good. We need somebody to 
show us better. Some of us are so hurt, we think there's no hope. We need somebody to show us the way. Jesus said it this way, John 16, you will all leave me. You will leave me all alone. Imagine that. They abandoned him after all that time. That's how losers they were. They didn't even stick with him when the going got tough. And I can tell you what, I've abandoned God a lot of times in my life too. But he's never abandoned me. How about that? I am not alone, Jesus said. My Father is with me. He will bring me all the way, even when I'm dead and I can't get up. He'll never leave me. And he won't leave you either. I've told you these things in me so that um, in me you may have peace. You know, he's saying, I'm not here to rip you up or insult you. I'm just telling you, here's reality. I won't leave you, even when you fail. And I know you'll fail. You'll even leave me. But that's okay. I won't leave you. And I will finish because my job is to treasure you and bring you to heaven. And I will do that. You will have trouble. Take heart, Jesus said. I've overcome the world. Matthew 28 says that I will be with you till the end of the age. How about it? Did you fail in life? Yeah. Is that good? No, it's not good. Is it fatal? No. So far, not. Because God will bring you all the way home. We have to do the running. I got that. But he won't drop you halfway. He'll make sure you get there. There's a fellow who wrote that earlier story that I referred to, wrote another section that I thought was interesting in his book. Uh, he was a lawyer, he said, for decades. Decades, he was a lawyer. And he did a lot of things, but he was a lawyer, and he knew that Jesus had a lot of things to say about lawyers, and most of it wasn't all that good. But he was a lawyer, and he loved Jesus. And he did his law work and he made a lot of money and he gave a lot of money away and it was kind of an uneasy truce for him and one day he decided that it was just a job for him and it was wasting his time because he learned about some things that were horrible in this world and he was busy making money and giving some money so he's, he was, loved god but he didn't love god completely and so he decided one day that he called his office staff into the office and he said I'm getting out of lawyering business he took his keys put them on the desk cleared out and walked away he didn't want to do that anymore he spent his full time now being a disciple will he still fail of course he will but you know what it takes us a long time to get to where God wants us to be it's a long race a whole lifetime is worth a race be about there don't be surprised that you hurt don't be surprised that you ache don't be surprised that someday you, you succeed at what you do and you feel wow i'm i'm just so good god will take you back a peg or two when you need that too or and he'll lift you up when you need that too don't be surprised are you doing what you're doing because you're capable of or because you're called to do it this man who wrote those words said he takes thursday every day, every week, to quit something. That's right. He's been doing something for a long time and he quits it to make sure that he's not doing anything he shouldn't be doing so that he can do what he needs to do to finish his race well. How about you? Is there something you're doing that's not what God wants you to do? Why don't you quit it so that you can do what God wants you to do? You see, God won't leave you alone he won't abandon you. He will get you all the way to the end. And he will keep at you until you are his treasure, completed and perfect in God's will. He reached to the end because he was given to the Father's plan completely to treasure his treasured people. He thrived on his Father's approval. He saw spiritual opportunity everywhere. He lo loved his flock with all of his life. And he never, ever, gives up on you or me. Lord God, bless each of us today. Care for us, love us, encourage us, pull us along when we fall. 
when we want to quit, pick us up, when we think it's too much, too hard, and we've been neglected and abandoned, lift us up with your spirit and pull us all the way home. In Jesus' name, amen.
Glad to you be with us this morning. This is the, the conclusion of our time of worship. I want to send you off with a blessing. May God go with you. May God reveal himself to you. May God reveal himself through you to the people around you so that we can fulfill the mission of Christ in this world, in our generation. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are God's treasure. We're going to look, talk about this more throughout this month. If there's an all-church fellowship meeting following this time of worship, this uh, live broadcast, so if you're with, with us while we're streaming live, you can go ahead and jump on to Zoom. Go to zoom.us, punch in the meeting ID 916-5228-1153. Or if you'd like to dial in, just use your telephone, dial area code 253 215-8782. It's the same meeting ID, 916-5228-1153. Really glad you got to be with us today. There is more to come. We'll see you later.